Hello and welcome to the Drum History Podcast. I am your host, Bart Vanderzee, and today I'm honored to be joined by Chet Falzerano, who is located in Germany. Chet, welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Yeah, this is uh, really cool. Today we're talking about Billy Gladstone, um, who you are an expert on and have written a book and just um, you're the Billy guy. So you're <laughs> you're located in Germany now, but you were born in Cleveland and grew up in Dayton, which is uh, very, very close to me. And <laughs> we're going to hear from him later. But I want to also just mention David Wood, who owns one of, I believe there's two in existence, if I'm not mistaken. We'll learn all about it. One of the Billy Gladstone drum sets that he purchased from you. So we're going to That's correct. pipe David in later and learn a little bit more about that for a little segment. But um, let's start off by, I just want to ask, how did you get into Billy Gladstone? What drew you to his his history? And, and what's the story with all that? Well, first, if I may, I'd like to change change expert to, to, to student. <laughs> I, I, okay. I'll take, the, I'll take a title of student rather than sure. expert. There's too many experts in this world okay, today, student, especially, I love that. As, especially in the vintage drone business. There's just <laughs> yes. too many experts. I'm so a student I'd as like, well. I'd like to just be a student. Um, okay. There was really no one particular thing that got me involved. Uh, probably the biggest influence was uh, an article that I read in Modern Drummer in the October of 81 issue of Modern Drummer by Ted Reed. Yes, he did a, a, a three or four page uh, recap of Billy Gladstone um, and his life and his his work and and his his drums and and so I, I just got very interested in that. I, so I contacted Ted Reed and just just a, a lovable guy. He was he was more than happy to to talk and and um, he, but he started off by saying, "Well, the first thing I would suggest is you get a copy of that of that." issue in October of 81, which of course I did. Um, I, I knew about Billy Gladstone primarily through his uh, practice pad. I mean, everyone is, everyone is, is well aware of, of his practice pad because it was, it was included with almost every Ludwig drum that ever left the factory. Sure. And so um, I was aware of, of, of Billy Gladstone only through that. But uh, Ted's article just enlightened me further about his drums, about uh, his playing, um, uh, about his inventiveness. He was one of the most inventive uh, persons I, I, I've ever encountered. It was just incredible the, the number of inventions that he came up with. He's credited with with like twenty patents. Wow! Um, and, and and it's a, it's a whole plethora of, of 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 things, not just drum related. I mean, there's a there's a tongue depressor, there's a key case. Hmm. Uh, yeah, it was, it's really interesting. He was just an inventive guy. But anyway, I, I, I had many conversations with, with Ted Reed, uh, because I got uh, interested in his drums. Um, uh, because as, as you're probably aware, there weren't a lot of custom drum builders back in those days. Sure. He started, he started building his own drums in, in the fifties. There, there are actually two, uh, versions of, of Gladstones. There's the Gretsch Gladstones. Which were were uh, was a was a partnership between uh, the Fred Gretsch Company and Billy Gladstone that started back in 1937 at the New York Music Trades Convention. They introduced the Gretsch Gladstone. Um, it's a it's a drum with a three way tuning device, and probably many of the people that are, are listening in today are, are aware of 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 what that how that works, but. Billy's uh, concern was to be able to tune his drum um, from the top only. He he had a, a very limited space in Radio City Music Hall where he was performing, um, and he also didn't like the idea of, of flipping the drum over. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it was distracting, and and he was a very formal uh, person. Sure. Um, uh, one of the one of the more interesting encounters I had was with Arthur Press. Uh, he he saw Billy when he was just a teenager at Radio City Music Hall, and he said it was just incredible to see this this tall because Billy was over six feet tall, mm. tall, um, well dressed. I mean, just perfectly dressed person rise up because the the the, uh, the 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 orchestra was on a when it was on a was on a rising platform at Radio City Music Hall, and he would rise up with the orchestra, and he would be in just full dress attention throughout the performance, and he he did not want to be able to have to turn his drum over to to tune the bottom head, 
Um, and in those days, drum heads were all calf. And so therefore, when, when it rose from the, when the orchestra rose from the basement to the, to the playing level, to the orchestra level, uh, there was a change in humidity and therefore the calf heads would change dramatically. And so, of course, it, it needed to be tensioned and needed to be tuned. And he didn't like the idea of, of flipping the drum over in front of his audience. So he wanted a drum that could be tuned from the top only. Hmm. So he devised this three-way tuning system whereby he was able to tune both the top and the bottom heads uh, from the top. There's a, there's a little two-step um, um, uh, top to the, to the tension rod. Uh, there's the regular square uh, tension rod that tunes the bottom head. And then the, below that, there's a, there's a hexagonal a nut that tunes the top tension rod. Hmm. Um, and because he had a key that, that had uh, three different sockets, one socket turned, as I said, the, 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 the bottom head, uh, the other socket turned the top head, but then he had a third socket where it was, it locked both of them together and you could turn both the top and the bottom simultaneously. Wow. So I just thought that was really ingenious that, <laughs> yeah. that, that, you know, that, that he would devise such a, uh, such a system. And as I said, back then there were no custom drum builders, you know, now there's a, there's just a, a plethora sure. of, of, of custom drum builders, but back then uh, it was a, a rare thing. Um, and, and so, um, I just got really interested in, in his drum and, 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 uh, I proposed to, to Ted Reed that he sell me one of his drums. He had a collection of, of seven Billy Gladstone drums and two Gretsch Gladstone drums. Um, as I said, it started with, uh, 1937 with Gretsch Gladstone, but then the, the, the second world war, uh, put a dampener in all that because there was a shortage of metal. Mm -hmm. And so he, uh, Gretsch discontinued making the drum because there was so much metal involved and, mm -hmm. and drums back during the war were, were made primarily with wood parts. There was very little metal in, in a drum. And so they discontinued the drum. And so, um, uh, it was during the war, during the war years, um, uh, there was no, no, uh, Gretsch Gladstone after mm. the war, they, they came out with a, with a Gretsch Gladstone, but it was just a, a two way drum, just a drum as, 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 as you sure. know, a drum today where you tune both the top and the bottom separately. Uh, and so Billy decided he would, uh, uh, continue building his own drums in the, he started in 1949, uh, building his own drums and, um, continued through the, the fifties and unfortunately died in uh, the early sixties. Mm, wow. Um, he built 60 drums and those are very prized drums because there's only, there was only 61 of them by my count. I've been able to account for 61 drums. Wow. Uh, Ted Reed said there were 50, but um, I've been able to come up with another 11 drums through the years just by um, making contact with various uh, Gladstone drum owners, and they would connect me with other owners. And, wow. and so I came up with a total of 61 drums. And so those are very prized drums. I mean, that's you hear about gladstone drums and you you um you know without knowing all this information you know they're rare but you, when you when you say there's 61 of them that means they're really rare that puts a number to it to go oh that's why they're they're so uh rare and i just want to like step in and say so i just released a very short episode last week about um a really short bio on ted reed because it was kind of a uh, I got some information from um, someone on a drum forum and I said, okay, this will be a good filler. Cause honestly, I didn't have a guest for that week. And I did, just, I was okay. I'll just read this little bio uh, about Ted Reed you though. And, and I got multiple messages uh, from people saying, what about Billy Gladstone, his relationship with Billy Gladstone, blah, 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 all this stuff, which was, I'm really glad people reached out, but I'm so it's, it's neat that you're talking right now about Ted Reed because it's very topical. Cause a week before this episode, I was, throwing some information there out there about him. And it's, it's, it's cool to, cause he's actually Ted Reed came off a little bit as like a, uh, I would say a little bit of a mystery because there wasn't that much information available on him, but it's cool that you got to actually talk to him and meet him and talk about Billy Gladstone and his collection and things It it really put, kind of personifies him a little bit more. 
Well, if you think not much is known about Ted Reed, you can imagine when I started with all this, nothing was known about Billy Gladstone. Yeah, I mean, sure. Ted, Ted was 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 the guy, and nobody knew about him. So yeah. you know, it was just that that short little four page article. It was in Modern Drummer that uh, uh, you know how many people saw that? Not many. Yeah. And so yeah, it was a great experience being able to connect with Ted and and to find out about his association with Billy. Absolutely. All right, so he was born December 15th, 1893. I'm looking on a Wikipedia page, which I believe is 100% uh, referenced from you and your... Uh, well, not, not 100% because, believe it or not, in my, the book that I wrote about Billy Gladstone, I got his birth date wrong. But, it, <laughs> but, 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 but wait, 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 wait. <laughs> let, me, let me just say that I got that from Ted Reed's article. So, oh you know, I, I thought it was correct. And so I went with it. And, and uh, I, I love the interview you had with John Aldridge about, about um, a, his book that he wrote, uh, it, like he said, once it's once you write a book, it's it's locked in forever. It's not like the internet where you can go back and yeah. revise. Yeah. Which so you know, unfortunately, I had had the wrong date, which is kind of kind of embarrassing. But you know, that's what Ted wrote, and so I just I took that as gospel, and yeah. I should have I should have done a little more investigating. Oh, well, I feel your pain on that one. I have had so many times where I go, oh geez, I thought that was true, and it just you just say it, but. It happens. But all right. So he, he again, born late 1800s. Um, and where was he born? In Romania. Romania. Yeah. OK. Yeah. Yeah. OK. And born William Goldstein. Is that correct? Yes. And 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 he, it changed to Gladstone because there was an error made in, in immigration. And, and and he just he just stuck with it. You know, wow. the, the, he got the wrong name. And I guess that that happened frequently back then. Uh but he just stayed stayed with the name uh, Gladstone. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then um, he is you. You kind of touched on a lot of stuff before, but just to kind of go a little deeper. So he was. Uh, he's really most famous, I would say, outside of his drum building, but as being the um, drummer at Radio City Music Hall. Right. Before yeah. that, I mean, is there any details you want to throw out about his, you know, his early career or you know things like that? Well, before that, he was with the the Capitol Theater uh, in New York. But but yeah, he played he played the theater circuit in New York. Uh, he hooked up with uh, uh, Rappé, who was the conductor at the time, at um, at uh, the Capitol Theater. When Rappé went to the Radio City Music Hall, he brought his protege uh, Billy Gladstone along with him, and so uh, wow. they did. They just kind of stayed together. Yeah, yeah. And you said it before, but always well-dressed and all that stuff. I, I can't, I only have an image in my mind of him wearing a tuxedo, tuxedo. and maybe because of the cover yeah. of your book, which I, I okay. So I've, I've mentioned it a few times, but you have um, a great book just about Billy Gladstone. Um, that Thank is, you. is, um, I think it's, it is the source, you know what I mean about Billy Gladstone? There's not like a bunch of different, like with Ludwig, there's a bunch of books and stuff, which are all great, but this is basically, um, it is the book. And, and I, all right. So if I'm looking at the cover of it, I, I find it so interesting that he's playing obviously a Gladstone snare, but he has that same very unique um, stand that's that Ted Reed is playing on the cover of syncopation where it's that almost like, um, I don't know. It looks very formal. It looks almost like a, like a, like it would be holding up like an expensive vase or something, <laughs> you know, what's, do you know any more about those, those kind of uh, stands? It was actually something that that uh, Gladstone put together. It's it's the it's it's the stand of a of a music stand from the Kliegel company. Kliegel made uh, uh, lights, is what they're mostly known for in television. I, I was in broadcasting for many years, and and Kliegel was was the name for lights, uh, studio lights. But they but besides lighting, they also they made uh, music stands. And that that base is is the base of one of their music stands, and then he just put a Wahlberg and OJ basket in, sure. inside it, and 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 did it all up in gold. Everything you know with yep. Billy thing was everything was formal, and so gold was <laughs> you know the, 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 the he, he he really liked everything in gold, which yeah. I thought was kind of cool too. Yeah, very just. Uh, I mean, everyone can just Google Billy Gladstone, and you'll see. But just such a dapper. Yes. Guy. Everything's very, yeah. I mean, his hair, everything is just, uh, is just perfect. Yeah. This episode is brought to you by Dream Symbols and their awesome new symbol bag. 
It is a heavy duty, strong, durable cymbal bag made for professionals with a nice tread on the bottom and it's reinforced everywhere that it needs to be. Uh, you have three compartments on it, two in the main pocket area and then one separate compartment on the outside of the bag. It has padded shoulder straps and a nice handle, or you can wear it with a single strap kind of across your body. It fits sizes up to a 24 inch ride, which is really huge. Um, and then you can just walk around having the confidence that your symbols are safe in this awesome bag from Dream Symbols. Check it out at dreamsymbols.com or on social media at Dream Symbols. I feel like he's always probably tinkering with things and building things. Um, when did he really, is it known when he got into drum making, you know? Well, it, like I said, it, it started in, in, uh, uh, with, with, uh, with, uh, the Gretsch company in 1937. Sure. Uh, they formed a partnership whereby, uh, Gretsch was interested in his, in his patent, this three-way patent device. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, uh, they formed a, a partnership and, and they were, putting out drums. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it, keep in mind that he was, he was at Radio City Music Hall. And if, if you've ever, I had the good fortune of, of going to radio while, while I was writing the book, I, I went backstage and, and met with the curator there at, at Radio City Music Hall. And it, it, it would be just an inventor's dream to, to work in a place like that because, you know, it had stages that were on hydraulic lifts that, uh, that were, so elaborate that uh, the, the government, uh, they were using the same kind of lifts in, in the, the battleships in mm. the war. Wow. And so they were a, a closely guarded uh, secret on, on how these lifts <laughs> were actually devised. Mm. And so you can imagine a guy who was inventive and who liked to tinker, you know, being at Radio City Music Hall with, you know, the latest and greatest of of lighting equipment, the latest and greatest of of, of staging. You know, it must have just been a dream for him because you yeah. know he he was surrounded by all this stuff. Absolutely. Um, did he was he like married with a family or was he a single guy? Actually, actually he was married to a rockette at Radio oh, wow. City Music Hall. Yeah, yeah. She was uh, she was a rock. Dorothy was her name. Uh, she they were they were married. Uh, 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 I, I started talking about Arthur Press seeing 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 Billy Gladstone at Radio City Music Hall. He said um, he, he said it was really incredible at the time because uh, they lived in an apartment uh, on Fifth Avenue, and he said when you went into the apartment there was a kitchen, but it really wasn't a kitchen kitchen because that's where Billy built his drums. Mm. Uh, they did very little cooking there because the show started at like ten o'clock in the morning and went until you know ten o'clock at night ten. 11, 10, 11 o'clock at night. And so most of the time they would eat out either at, at the cafeteria at Radio City Music Hall or go out to a restaurant uh, w with their colleagues. Um, sure. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. Wow. <laughs> yeah. All right. Maybe we talk a little bit about his technique, which is commonly known as the Gladstone technique. Um, wh why don't you explain that a little bit about his style? Because he's a great teacher as well, which I'm sure we'll cover. But um, wh what is his technique all about? Oh, well, th this is going to be a subject that uh, I don't know quite how to approach this. <laughs> um, I don't know that there really was a specific technique. If you pull up on YouTube, the Gladstone technique, you'll see just a plethora of YouTube videos on this is what the Gladstone technique is. Sure. Well, uh, none of these people have ever even met the man. <laughs> how can they say what the technique <laughs> is, you know? Um the one person who who studied with Billy the longest was was Arnie Lang. He studied with Billy for three years. Um, he put out a video uh, about the technique, about Billy's technique. Um, and before he uh, decided to do this video, he contacted me and said, "Would you care to get involved?" And I said, "Of course, you know, because I had already I wrote the book and and uh, I, I delved a little bit in into technique." But not a lot because um, you know, I never met the man. I, I you know, I, I've never even had the good fortune of seeing him play. Sure. Um, so how can I say what the technique is? You know, and unless you've actually studied with him, yeah. it's no, kind no. of foolish to be saying, "Well, here's what the technique. It's the <laughs> finger technique." Well, yeah, you know, there were fingers involved. Ted Reed had the best description. He said, uh, 
the way Billy saw it was like the key of a piano. You strike the key of a piano, it in turn strikes a lever that in turn strikes a hammer that comes down and strikes the, 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 the string of, of a piano. And he said, that's what Bill, that's how Billy really saw the technique. Um, it, it, it's not just fingers. It's not wrists. It's not arms. It's, it's everything. Everything has to be in, in conjunction. Mm. Has to be together. Yeah. So you know, I can I can pass along that information because it was from Ted Reed. When I interviewed Joe Morello, he talked about you know the, the just the fingers, um, but you know it 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 had to have been just more than fingers. Morello, if you've ever seen, I've, I had the good fortune of not only interviewing him but seeing him play. Uh, it, what he could do with drumsticks was just phenomenal, yeah. just unbelievable. And he said it was Billy that put the finishing touch on on his playing um, because um, uh, he helped him with that finger technique. Hmm. But I don't, I don't believe, I don't know because I've never t- taken lessons and never even met Billy Gladstone. So how can I say for sure? But I don't believe it was just fingers. It had to be more than just that. In yeah. fact, uh, Arnie Lang described his encounter with Billy Gladstone. They met at Radio City Music Hall. Uh, a colleague of his, uh, Farberman, invited uh, Arnie Lang to go to Radio City Music Hall to meet Billy Gladstone. And of course, you know, Arnie was was totally into that. Um, uh, he said, we all went to a practice room together and and uh, he said, okay, everybody, uh, let's let's play. And so everybody just started playing. And he said, Billy Gladstone came over to me and, and he says, you're experiencing pain in this area of your arm, aren't you? Hmm. And, you know, Lang was just kind of like, uh, yeah, well, why? How, do, how did you know that? And he said, well, because of the way you're holding the stick. He said, I, I think, and, and, and you're probably in your left hand, you're experiencing pain in this part of your hand. And he's like, he was kind of taken back because it was all true. Yeah. And he said, the next thing I said was, do you give lessons? <laughs> and he said, for three years, you know, he studied with, with, with Billy Gladstone. And so I'm, I'm, I wonder if, you know, the technique was geared to that particular person. Sure. You know, if, if, he, if he's having pain in his hand or pain in his arm, well, then, you know, you need to be doing this or you need to be doing that. Or in case of Joe Morello, if you want to, you know, get this, this, this facility with your fingers, you need to be doing this. So I think it was geared. I don't know, mm-hmm. but it seems to me as though it's geared to a particular person's uh, needs rather because there is no technique. There was no there were no books. Uh, Lang said that you know they never studied out of books. It was mostly uh, execution, yeah, rather than technique. Wow, because, that's interesting. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. He uh, and I imagine he was he was probably a, he seems like he'd be a pretty uh, in tune person if that's his style to to like and sensitive to the changes of or of watching someone and what they're doing and helping people. Like his teaching style would be very. Um, like you said, custom tailored. I mean, that's a great way to, I think if you're going to assume something that seems like a good assumption um, from everything we, because well, how else do you know? <laughs> you know? And it also kind of fits with his personality, you know, yeah. because he was an inventive person. Mechanics, you know, was important to him, obviously. Yeah. And so he would know that, well, if you hold the stick this way, it's going to cause problems, Yeah. you know? And, and so, yeah, that's my take on it. Yeah, absolutely. No, I think that's smart. And and maybe we jump now into um so as a teacher, uh he did have a number of students like you said, um and it he he really taught some big name players. And I think that's maybe what also led I I think with Billy Gladstone there's a little bit of like a almost like mythical like with the things maybe again it's the the 61 snare drums that are in existence, but there is definitely a uh, and also maybe it's the lack of video and there's not that many pictures out there. Like it just adds a little something to it. But also you hear about him, um, you know, teaching great drummers. Like if correct me if I'm wrong, but he worked with Buddy Rich a little bit. Right. And then yes. uh, Joe Morello, as you said, Shelly Mann. Um, is there any more info about that? Like w- where would they do the lessons typically? Was it at Radio City or would it be at the pe- people's houses or wherever? I mean, what's what's it? What else do we know about that? Mostly it was at his apartment, as, as I understand mm. from, from 
the guys that I interviewed, Arthur Presset, you know, that's where he had his lessons with him. Uh, Styx McDonald, the, the, the one country drummer, <laughs> actually took lessons from Billy Gladstone and, and had uh, drums and a drum set made uh, for him. Uh, also met Billy at his apartment. Uh, so I think a lot of it was, was there. It was also on the road because, you know, it, it, after he left Radio City Music Hall, he went on, on the road with uh, the, the My Fair Lady musical. Mm -hmm. And that's where uh, Joe Morello had most of his encounters with, with, uh, with uh, Gladstone. Was, was, it was in San Francisco because it, they were performing. My Fair Lady was performing at, uh, in, in San Francisco, and, and they would meet after the show. Sure. Yeah, as uh, I pretty pretty recently a couple weeks ago had a uh, Buddy Rich episode about Buddy's snare drums and stuff like that, and um, it's interesting to think of Buddy Rich as we all know of this you know mega you know the 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 king of drummers kind of guy uh, taking lessons. I mean, but I, I feel like Buddy would kind of bow down to someone like Billy Gladstone, who very respected, kind of a, a working musician. I'm sure. Um, they got along well as just both great drummers. Well, if 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 you know anything about about Buddy Rich, you know he he didn't bow down to to anybody. You know he was. Yeah. I mean that there there are stories about him, and I don't know if they're all true or not. But, I know. You know there's there's a story about him and Bart Deems, and they kind of lock horns at one time. Yeah. And, who's and, the world's and, fastest in that situation? Yeah. Who's the know? world's fastest? Yeah. But um, but but I have a if you go on YouTube. I've put up a number of, of uh, YouTube videos about about Billy Gladstone. One of them uh, is an interview that was conducted with Buddy Rich, where Buddy said, um, um, I'll paraphrase it because I don't have the exact words here with me now, but he said, uh, there's only one person that's better than me. I mean, that, that in itself says something, right? Yeah. <laughs> because can you imagine an ego that's saying, you know, there's only one person that's better than me. <laughs> and he said, and that's, that's Billy Gladstone. Wow. Well, you know, if you've ever seen Buddy Rich play, it's, it was just, it was just phenomenal what that guy can, could, could do, you know? Yes. And so if he had that kind of facility and he admired and said, there's only one person that's better than me. My God, what, what, yeah. what could this guy do? You know, yeah. it was just incredible. That's a hell of an endorsement from Buddy. Yeah, he said he went to to Radio City Music Hall and, and he would he would sit in the, the the farthest back seat in Radio City Music Hall just to to hear him and watch him articulate off a snare drum. And he said what the guy could do was incredible. Now Buddy Rich uh, said it wasn't fingers. You know, who knows? But anyway, he said it was it was all in the wrist. Who knows? You know, it may be true. It may not be true. But, um, uh, hmm. you know, that Buddy Rich would talk about his playing to that level. I mean, it must have just been phenomenal. Yeah. And all right. So on that note, Billy is not, though, he's not at Radio City Music Hall playing a drum solo every night. He's doing drumming for shows. I mean, it's exactly it's very. But so, so he must have been very intentional and proper and correct in everything he was playing, but to, to be blowing buddy away when you're playing sort of um, music that's there to supplement. I mean, you're again, it's not about the drummer. Correct me if I'm wrong, but these shows it's exact. You're exactly correct. <laughs> but to be doing it, something that's so precise that you're impressing buddy rich. That's even more impressive that he's not doing it as a solo, uh, you know, ripping chops kind of thing. Yeah, they would they 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 would they they'd say that you know drummers would would come to see him play and and they'd come back uh, a second night and it would be just totally different the way huh. he would he, he would approach something cool. and you know if it was if it was just a glissando roll that started started the show it was just you know a whisper and then it would just turn into this roar that would just fill the the auditorium you know and radio city music hall is is huge so yeah. you know to fill that place with sound must have been yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow cool so um we talked a little bit about when he you know his really early childhood and everything kind of but do you know any information um about when he started playing drums or his like early, early, you know, dad bought him a drum set and then he was a prodigy. Any, any info that early? It started with, he, he, he took a job as a teenager at Wanamaker's, which is a, a big department store in New York city. 
and and they had a drum and bugle corps and uh he went to them and they said well we need we need buglers and he said well i want to play the drums and they said well sorry but we need buglers <laughs> and and so it ended up you know he he started uh playing uh with them on the bugle um um but then he he just gravitated over over to drums and and uh it took off from there yeah gotcha. so he was just, he started as a teenager wow. uh, you know it was just a just a a side thing working at Wanamaker's and and being part of the the drum and bugle corps there. Hmm. It's interesting too because for someone of his skill level to be starting as a teenager, I don't want to say that's later than I expected, but you know, you obviously we know Buddy started when he was let's say as the story goes like 18 months old or something like that with Buddy. So it's kind of neat that Billy was in his, you know, he was a teenager when he started and became so yeah. incredible. Um, yeah. Yeah. All right, why don't we talk about the drums? I mean, the Gladstone okay. drums are, I keep using the word, but kind of mythical because of how valuable they are, um, just everything about them. And and so we've learned about his Gretsch Gladstone collaboration, which I assume value-wise, those are valuable and rare, but really the the his own Gladstone snare drums and the drum sets, which we'll talk about, those are really the like the creme a la creme of, uh, <laughs> of, of snare drums. Of snare exactly. drums. I mean, they're and about sets. as good as it gets. Yeah. 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 He built, he built 61 snare drums and four of them were with sets. So there were actually four drum sets, okay. but only two of them exist today. Gotcha. Uh, one of them was, uh, as I said, a uh, sticks McDonald, uh, was a country drummer, had a, had a set in all bird's eye maple, which you can imagine must've been just gorgeous. Right. Yeah. That was destroyed in a fire. Oh. Um, and then Billy's own set, which was in black lacquer, uh, the bass drum was destroyed in a flood. And so only the toms and snare drum are original. The bass drum uh, was redone with a different shell, but of course that doesn't, that makes it non-original. Yeah. Then there was a set that was made for Maury Feld, who was the drummer with uh, Benny Goodman. Is a White Pearl set that uh, that's in the uh, Charlie Watts collection. Mm. Uh, although this that set was uh, the the snare drum went missing uh, and was was uh, paired up with Cozy Cole snare drums, which was also in White Pearl. So it's a complete set, but it's not original. Mm. And then there was uh, a Silver Sparkle set that was built for. His student, uh, a Billy student, is Saul Leslie Bimo. Wow, unbelievable! Yeah. All right, so what? Let's talk about like the construction of the of, of any uh, you know your average. I, I say lightly average Billy Gladstone <laughs> snare drum. Um, <laughs> and were they they were all custom made? Right out of those sixty one drums, they were made for individuals. I'm assuming he wasn't like stocking a store with you know his drums. They would be made to order. Is that right? That's correct. There, he he had he had. Uh, th they say that he carried around a trunk that had drums uh, that he put together for display. You know, this is this is what the drum is. He made them in two different sizes: a six by fourteen. And a seven by fourteen. A six by fourteen was primarily uh, for drum set. A seven by fourteen was for the the concert snares. Hmm. Yeah, interesting. And and uh, the hardware was all uh, custom hardware, as you can imagine, with that three way tuning device. Yeah, uh, the special key. Yeah. but it also had just a phenomenal throw off. One of the the, the best throw off, in my estimation, of course, I, I'm, I'm prejudiced, but sure. the best throw off that was ever designed was was his throw off. Yeah. Can you explain the throw off a little bit? Because there's there's a lot of um, it's a little different with the the mechanisms on it. Um, how, can you go into a little more detail about the throw off and how it works and what makes it's, it special? It's a very simple uh, 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 operating throw off. It's a drop down design. In other words, uh, in, in fact. Uh, uh, that was another thing that Arthur Press commented on. He said you could see Billy uh, uh, flick his stick and just tap it uh, because the the arm of the throw off was just above the top rim, yep. and he could tap that 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 throw off arm and and flip it back on and and just do it in with phenomenal speed. Uh, but yeah, it was uh, just a, a drop down design hmm. that has been copied. Many times over the years, Gretsch had a had a drop down design, although it wasn't nearly as good as as uh, the Gladstone. Of course, the Gretsch Gladstone was 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 
the, the precursor. Sure. Um, but his, the one that he developed in the fifties was really incredible. It, 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 it worked much better than the, than the Gretsch Gladstone. Yeah. Um, so you said before, like the hardware's custom, all this stuff. I mean, I have this image in my mind of him doing all this in his kitchen, but like, w- like the shell construction and really like building, I mean, like you can't obviously, uh, be pouring molds of <laughs> with metal and everything in your kitchen. How, where did he create all of the, like, I mean, what is the shell, all that good stuff? Well, the shell is actually a, a Gretsch shell. Um, all, um, all the drums are the old three ply Gretsch shells. Okay. Um, uh, he didn't like the six ply. He thought those shells were were too heavy. He liked everything light, um, so he used the shells from from Gretsch, and 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 the shells were drilled at the Gretsch factory. Hmm. Uh, Bill Hagner was the was the plant manager. I had an interview with Bill, and he said that Billy was very precise in how the uh, the hardware was mounted on the drum. Everything had to be exactly uh, pristine. Had to be perfectly placed. Because he didn't want it uh, tensioned uh, to, to, to tension against the shell, everything sure. had to be free floating, and so he said uh, Billy was very uh, particular on on how the, the shells were drilled, and then Billy would assemble uh, the drums at his at his apartment. But he used Gretsch um, shells and he used Gretsch rims, as a matter of fact. But he mm. liked the the early what, what known today as the stick chopper. Yep. Uh, a die cast rim rather than the later one that has the rolled over edge. And Bill Hagner said that's also again, because he liked the, the lighter, uh, the lighter weight of, of the stick chopper. Hmm. And also uh, if, if you've had any experience with, with a stick chopper, as opposed to the, the heavier uh, triple flange that the Gretsch developed in, in the sixties, uh, it's a different sound. Um, he, I'm, I'm sure he also appreciated the sound that was derived from from the thinner uh, hoops as well. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Um, it's neat his connection to Gretsch, you know, because I, I knew obviously the Gretsch. You see the Gret- the Gretsch Gladstones, which there were more of like those are out there, correct? I mean, there was a fair amount of those made. That's fair not- amount, not a lot though. Yeah, sure. Um, I, 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 all the drums I've had, I've had um, six Gretsch Gladstones. And and uh, the ones from the, the early ones had numbers inside, and I don't know this for a fact, but I believe those were production numbers mm. because uh, they're they're sequential. And the earlier drums that I've had obviously have lower numbers. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, sure. We'll soon dial in David uh, Wood, who's going to talk about his drum set. But why don't before we do that, why don't you maybe give us a little bit more background on? this particular drum set uh, about the history because David Wood bought it from you. So maybe how you acquired it and then we'll get David's um, uh, info and then what he's doing, the very cool thing that he is doing with this drum set. We'll have David tell us that. But how did you acquire it? And then how did you end up getting it sold uh, to David? Well, I've had um, so far, I've had... um, Six Billy Gladstone drums. One of them is the set with the Saul Leslie Bimel set. And I had um, uh, six Gretsch Gladstone drums. One of those was also a set. Um, I saw, I, I found this uh, Gretsch Gladstone set. It was in white marine pearl, just a gorgeous set um, that, I, that I procured. And um, then I saw an ad uh, that the owner of this this set, this Silver Sparkle Solusly Bimel set, was selling the drum set, and he said uh, uh, offers considered. Hmm. So I called him and I I, I I I said, you know, here's what I can here's what I can offer you, and he said, oh, it was like half of what he wanted, sure. right? Yeah. And I said, well, I'm sorry, but you know, I can't afford that, <laughs> uh, so I'll pass. And um, I ended up then buying this this Gretsch Gladstone set, and sure enough, about uh, a month later, the guy calls me up and he says, "Well, I've changed my mind. I'll sell you the set for the price that you said." And I said, "Well, you're too yeah. late. I just bought a Gretsch Gladstone set. I don't have the money now." And he yeah. said, "Well, you know, that, that's all too bad." Well, that drove me crazy because, of course, I wanted the Billy Gladstone set, um, 
And so I, I, I unloaded that Gretsch Gladstone set, called him up, and he still had the set. So I, I bought bought it from him. Wow. Uh, he wants to remain uh, anonymous, and so I'll respect that. Sure. The, the, the previous owner, but he got the set from um, Ippolito's in mm-hmm. New York City. Apparently, Saul Leslie Bimo, who was a student of Billy's, who also taught uh, uh, drums, uh, lived in New Jersey. And he played around the New York area. Um, it, it must have been when he passed or when he decided to stop playing, he sold a set to Ippolito's. Ippolito's uh, sold a set to the, the, the previous owner. I got the set from him. Uh, but the, the, the set was so pristine when I got it that I was sure that it had been recovered because the pearl was just gorgeous on it. And, you know, it, it, pearls, as, as in some of your uh, podcasts, uh, they fade. Yeah. And it, there's, there's barely any fade at all on this. There's hmm. a slight amount of ginger ale, but very, very little fade. I thought for sure the set had been recovered. He said, no, no, I think, I think it's original. And sure enough, when I got the set, it was true. It hadn't even been recovered. The, 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 it had wood hoops and on both the toms and the bass drum. And, and I believe that the paint on the hoops is still original. It had a few chips on it, of course, because, you know, that's going to happen. Yeah, sure. But the set was, was just gorgeous. And, and I kept it that way uh, for many mm-hmm. years. I got the set in, I guess it was the early 90s. Wow. Um, and I kept it for, for many years. And then now in my advanced years, I've decided to, to let my collection uh, supplement my retirement. Sure. Uh, and so I decided to sell it. And so uh, I, I did it with uh, Steve Maxwell. Mm-hmm. I brokered the set with Steve. Uh, also, he, uh, at the same time, uh, that gold drum that's on the cover of, of Billy's book, uh, I got from Ted Reed. Uh, he brokered that at the same time. Both those sets, the, the set and that snare drum, uh, just sold recently. Uh, yeah. And David, David Wood. Uh, yeah. yeah. He, he, David Wood also bought the Arthur Press drum from me. Wow. Uh, Steve Maxwell uh, sent me an email and said, Chet, I've got, I've got a guy here that wants to, to buy the Arthur Press drum. Um, and at the time I wasn't really considering selling my collection. I still wanted to maintain it. And I said, well, you know, let me think about it. And so, uh, so he said, well, here's the guy's name. And I said, no, no, no. If if I do it, I want to do it through you because I don't want I don't want you know I I, I like to have a middleman. You know, it's yeah, good sure. to have some, yeah. that protection. Uh, and so uh, Steve uh, Steve uh, contacted David. David was the student of Arthur Press, so it was just a natural fit, you know. And I, and I felt really good about that because yeah. then I knew it was going to a really good home, you know, somebody that would really appreciate it, and not just sit up on on some collector's shelf, you know. He knew he obviously not only knew Arthur Press, but they had a very close relationship. So yeah. it was really nice that he ended up with that drum. Absolutely. And we'll get David on the phone here in a second. But you had to just when you first saw that that Gladstone drum set was for sale, was you did was your mind just going, Oh my God, I have to get this thing. <laughs> I have it. I have to have it. Yeah. I mean, you know, that, I, I knew at the time there were there were only four sets and and only uh, well, uh, Billy said that the bass drum hadn't been destroyed yet, so that that was still a complete set. Uh, but you know, I knew uh, I, I had many conversations with Sticks McDonald. I knew that that set was destroyed, so there was only three sets in existence. Wow. And and here's something: that one of them is for sale. I had to have it, you know. And wow. and the price, you know, I I paid a, a pretty hefty price sure, for it sure. back then. But um, you know, yeah, you got to do what you got to do. <laughs> We're going to now jump over and speak with David Wood about uh, acquiring the Billy Gladstone drum set. And he is doing something very cool with it, which we're going to learn about right now. Very cool. Welcome, David Wood, to the show. I'm excited to hear about your Billy Gladstone drum set. Well, thank you for having me. I've uh, I've enjoyed uh, and admired your work for some time and enjoyed listening. And uh, I'm grateful that you have me. Thank you so much. And uh, this is a special one because, honestly, I don't do really... These kind of two-part uh, interjected, you know, having having a special guest such as yourself on, so it's a lot of fun to be doing that. But um, let's uh, first off, let's let's set it up with um, Chet. Kind of described the drums a little bit and talked about how there were four Billy Gladstone drum sets, and then there was a fire, and there was a flood, and now we're down to two, and one of which you 
acquired from Chet. So why don't we pick it up there and you can tell the story of how you got them and what you're going to be doing with them and maybe what drew you to um, such a rare special drum set. Sure. A lot of stars had to line up uh, for for this to, to, to work out. And um, Steve, Steve Maxwell wrote me uh, and announced that this set would be, you know, com- becoming available and he was letting his people who would, uh, no. And I, uh, I sent the link to, to, to my wife. I was like, what do you think? And she's like, you're not thinking of, of, of buying those, I hope. <laughs> and <laughs> I, uh, I said, no, but I'm just showing you that aren't they amazing? And, and I said, I, I, I can't be responsible for, for those drums. I, 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 they should be in a museum. Yeah. And, uh, and her eyes lit up, you know, that's a great idea. And, and so, um, we decided to, uh, to buy them and put them in a museum. Wow. Which, that's- so there it is. I kind of set it up before. So you're donating these beautiful drums to the percussive arts society. And, um, there's going to be an amazing exhibit, uh, in 2022, which I think is just what Billy Gladstone, um, his legacy needs is something like this to bring the spotlight to him. So I think that's unbelievable that you, you are doing that. Well, y- yes. And like I said, a lot of stars had to line up for this to be possible. So in my world, the stars have names. So if you don't mind, I'll, sure. I'll, I'll, I'll tell the story. First, Steve Maxwell, who uh, is a great broker of, of vintage drums. He, he, he contacted me and he's, he's the guy. If you're ever looking for something, he helped me find uh, a, a, a Gladstone that was very close to my heart. Uh, um, and that's how, how I met him. And, and, uh, I've bought drums and, and other instruments from him since, uh, obviously first and foremost, Chet for taking care of these drums and, and, um, for so many years, I mean, there, there's, there's only two kits left yeah. and, and, uh, we, you know, they could easily be lost in somebody's basement or, uh, something. So, and then uh, we had a different plan for these drums, if I'm perfectly honest, than the Percussive Arts Society. Again, it was Steve that, that put me in touch with, uh, with Josh, and I, uh, uh, Josh Simons, uh, who's the executive director there. And I talked to him for a while, and we just clicked. I, I liked his sense of humor. I, liked it. I, I, I just got along with yeah. him. And it was at a weird time where you know, we were sort of wavering, do we really want to do this or not? And, and, and after talking to him, I, you know, we said, yeah, Steve's right. This is the, this is the perfect place for them. So, um, so Josh, uh, the, the percussive art society is lucky to have him. He's a great guy. And, uh, and then anybody who plays drums learns at an early age, how, how lucky they are to have someone that tolerates, uh, their, 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 um, passion for, sure. for drumming. And if you find, if you find somebody, that's supportive. Uh, beyond that, it's wonderful. So we we learned that with our parents and our later our partners and spouses. Yeah. So I have to uh, I have to give it up for for uh, my wife uh, Colette Holt. Uh, she's only she's only wood when we go to the dry cleaners <laughs> or go to music events. Yeah. So, I'm this, my uh, wife has uh, the different last names. Uh, uh, I, I I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah, uh, she, she's uh, uh, she's wonderful she's in a completely different line of uh, line of work but that that uh that she got such a such a thrill out of this and was so so uh willing to to go along with it was was uh, uh we, we're all lucky for that as well absolutely so yes we we went to PASIC um uh in november yeah, when, when, yeah it was in november and we we saw that the, they have the drum set up and the the stage is preparing for uh for the exhibit to open in early 22. Mm. So I, 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 I guess I, I will have to hear from Josh. I'm not sure what their timeline is. Yeah. And I can provide more information as that, you know, as that comes around. Um, and that's obviously in Indianapolis, which is uh, very close to me. So as soon as it opens, I'll be sure to, um, check it out and report back. And then we also have, um, there's some info that, that, uh, Chet kind of, mentioned to us about you and Arthur Press. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit, maybe briefly, who Arthur Press 
uh, was and then your connection with him and a little bit about that snare. And then we can um, hop back over to Chet and kind of learn more about Billy. But um, yeah, talk about Arthur a little bit. Yeah, uh, well, Arthur was my uh, my teacher and mentor. He was the uh, solo snare drummer and assistant timpanist at the Boston Symphony. And I began study with him. I probably I was still at I think I was still in college at at, at Berkeley School of Music, um, and I started studying at his house. And uh, we would sometimes uh, because it was close to school, I'd go to the hall and have lessons there. And one day he pulled out his Gladstone drum uh, and to show it to me. I, I I took a couple lessons on it when we would when I would have a lesson at the hall. And I, you know, I had never seen anything like that. I, I remember going and telling the other, you know, the other students in school about it. And, um, I always wanted, uh, that drum or one like it, but I, you know, how do you ask, yeah. uh, you know, somebody <laughs> like that for, for, uh, you know, for their prize yeah. possession, uh, you know, if you ever, it, it, it was too hard. So. I was on the road and uh, I was picking up some sticks at, at, at Vic Firth and Vic told me that Arthur had sold all his instruments and quit the symphony. And I was like, no, did he sell his Gladstone? And he, and he said, sold everything. Wow. And, you know, his, his, his wife had died and, and he just left the, the orchestra. And, and I, I just always regretted not, not having the opportunity to, to, by that drum because um, I, I just loved it so much. And so that's how uh, I was telling my wife that story, a couple, you know, at the beginning of the pandemic, I guess. And, and she's like, well, why don't you try to find it? And I was like, well, you know, I probably should. Somebody, yeah. somebody bought it. And, and, and so I called Steve and it's, you know, if anybody would know, it would be him. And I left him a message. I said, I'm, former student of Arthur Press, and, and I'm looking for uh, his Gladstone drum. you have any idea where it might be? And he called me back a couple of days later, and, and uh, he said, I know exactly where it is. And, I, and he said, great Gladstone collector in Italy has it. And um, I said, do you think he would sell it to me? And he's like, no. <laughs> and I was like, oh, well, that's too yeah. bad. But, well, let him know if he's ever interested in um, – I would, I would really like to have it. And, um, and he did, I don't know how much time passed, but he, he called me back and he, he said, we're, we're, we're not, um, owners of these drums. We're, we just take care of them until the next person does. Yeah. And, and because you're a, a, a student of, of Arthur's, you know, he thinks that this is Chet, by the way, he thinks that you, you might, you might be a good curator for it. So, he agreed to sell it to me, and it it arrived uh, not 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 long after. And it sits. I'm looking at it now. It sits in my in my studio as a as a reminder of uh, that time and and my great relationship with Arthur. And uh, it's a beautiful beautiful instrument. And it was because of that purchase that Steve thought of me when this drum set came about. Wow. So that's now. Yeah. That's that's how the the connection happened. That's just so cool. I mean, it, it's guys like you and Chet and Steve Maxwell who are keeping this stuff uh, from, I mean, these are material items that are typically made of, you know, wood and can, are, are not, you know, they're not uh, invincible. They can, they can be damaged. So you need to take care of them. So it's great that um, you guys are uh, able to do this, to, to keep these ultra rare drums safe because, um, I mean, I've talked about it with Chet on the other portion of the show, but I mean, these are kind of holy grail drums. It does not get more rare than, um, you know, a, a snare drum that's one of 61 or a drum set that's one of two. <laughs> it can't be. Yeah. Nothing is more rare. That, that's true. I mean, when you when yeah, I'm not going to embarrass anybody, but when a, a big drum company comes out with a limited uh, edition snare drum say you know signed and yeah. numbered it's one of a thousand <laughs> and you know it and this guy made 61 drums in his kitchen <laughs> exactly in, in, yeah. in, in you know in, in 1950 and people are still talking about it yeah it is remarkable it's also a tribute to i mean people lose 
a great gig and sometimes fall apart. I mean, yeah. Billy Gladstone was was very, uh, um, you know, he thought he 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 would always be at, at Radio Sim at, at um, Radio City, and he he lost that job, you know, very unjustly, hmm. and he he could he could have just you know gotten depressed and but he didn't he he started making drums and you know lemonade out of lemons however you want to put it yeah i mean his overall demeanor as a person is very much uh that he's he's such a well he's such a put together guy that um i you know of course he moves on and creates some of the most um rare drums in the world it's just a, it's a cool story for sure and and for anyone who is curious and wants to learn more about it chet's book is is magnificent I mean, if if i had my way and for any influence i have on this the exhibit at the museum will be chet's book in a visual form i mean he covered it all and it's it's uh it's re it's really a lot of a lot of fun and very informative and i don't think any drummer at least of my generation can can read it without finding some names in it that mean something to them yeah. because that uh uh so it's it, it, it's it's fun. It's fun. Every every page turn, it's a new fact that you're learning. It's it's great. Absolutely. On that note, David, I guess we'll hop back over to Chet in uh, Germany, and then we will learn more about Billy Gladstone. But I want to thank you for taking the time to come on and do this little you know short segment in the middle of this episode, and really p helping me put this together and reaching out and getting this episode um, started. And this all happened in a really a short period of time which is just awesome um so i really appreciate you sharing your knowledge with us well thank you i thank you for having me i look forward to to listening more and we'll see you at uh the percussive art society soon so everyone just learned that the amazing you know story about david and his drum set and how he is donating it to the percussive art society and we can all look out for that um his setup that he's going to be displaying in 2022 Wow. Pretty. Isn't that really cool? I yeah. mean, talk about it. You know, I, I said before, before you cut away there that it, you know, the Arthur Press drum went to a good home. I can't imagine the set going to a better place. I mean, you know, when, when Steve Maxwell said, you know, Hey, I'll broker the set for you and, and, you know, let's, let's set a price. And we, we did all that. And, and, uh, and I thought, well, you know, geez, I hate to see the set go, but <laughs> I wouldn't also mind having the money to supplement yeah. my retirement here. Sure. Um, uh, you know, I figured, well, it'll end up on some collector's, you know, collection. But here, you know, when David <laughs> did this, I thought, how cool is that, that now, you know, so many people are going to get to enjoy and see that set. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. I mean, it's it's about as perfect as it could be um, for such history. And now I feel I feel confident that it's not going to get destroyed in a fire or in a flood. <laughs> I think it's in good, safe hands. Not that that would happen at David's house, but you know what I mean? I think it's it's now amongst other great collectibles um, yes, and yes. all that stuff. So let's talk a little bit more about Billy Gladstone's inventions. Um, besides, you know, obviously we, we know his drums. What are some other things that he invented? You mentioned a practice pad, and I know he's done some, you know, the some cool stuff with cymbals. What else do we know him for? Well, he, uh, he, as, as you, you mentioned, the, the practice pad, everybody's aware of the, the Bill Gladstone practice pad. It was a really ingenious practice pad because, you know, it, it it actually has a drum sound. You know, it's not like just the rubber pads that Ludwig and, and sure. all the rest of the companies were making. Um, but it also had two steps. There was a harder center section of the of the pad, but you could also play on the outer section. So there was there was two different sounds that you could get out of it. Um, so it was really a pretty ingenious practice pad yeah and for people who I, there, I did a practice pad episode and we talked about it for people who maybe don't know uh like chet was saying it it basically is everyone's every you you've definitely seen it if you've played the drums for a while it's that rubbery it it's an insert that goes on your snare drum basically exactly. yeah, um, yeah, yeah. so i'm sure everyone's seen it but yeah okay so carry on from there well, um, then he also, as I said, uh, had a lot of non-drum related uh, inventions. Uh, there was there was a key case. The the story goes that that uh, one of the people in in the in the orchestra at Radio City Music Hall dropped their keys 
and and Billy strung them all together on a string, and it gave him the idea of of, of this of this key case, hmm. whereby uh, the the keys would go inside a case, but they would be on a string, a, a chain, um, um, and those were available uh, up until just recently. Still available. Uh, there was a there was a company in Florida where I, I bought I, I got my first one from Ted Reed, hmm. but but you could also buy them from this company in Florida. But they, they've since uh, 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 sold all, all their supplies, so there's no more of them left. But sure. wow. um, yeah, he had th- those symbols, uh, the handheld uh, sock symbol that was before uh, the, the Gretsch Gladstone drum was even developed. Mm-hmm. Um, I mentioned that if you go to YouTube and and you pull up uh, Chet Falzerano, you'll see uh, there's a little over more than a dozen uh, videos that I put together. One of them is is Chick Webb uh, playing that that sock symbol. Uh, wow! So yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's some history right there. Yeah. Cool. Wow. Um, I I, I should have asked this before when we were talking about the Gladstone drums, but I just want to so we kind of know if if you're you know if someone's lucky enough to be buying a Gladstone snare drum, one of his, one of the sixty one. What was the time frame? Um, that he I guess it would be post Gretsch, right? The the Gretsch Gladstone in from thirty seven to post war. I believe you said. When 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 was the time frame that like he was making his own drum? So if you find one, they're likely a nineteen fifty blank. Um, exactly. What was it, that time frame? He started building them in nineteen forty nine. Uh, the first drum was uh, was for um, Shelley Mann. Mm. Um, that was that was his first, and Shelley was one of one of Billy's students. Mm. Uh, oh. In fact, that drum is also at uh, PAS. They're going to display the Shelley Mann drum and the. Um, Buster Bailey. Buster Bailey was the uh, percussionist in, in the New York Philharmonic. Um, he was, uh, he, I believe, his was the was the second drum. Wow! Uh, but yeah, through through the years, then um, he built drums for geez, all all the the great players. He built one for Buddy Rich. That one's still out there mm-hmm. um, somewhere. Uh, it's it's never it's never surfaced, um, but. Yeah, he built them for for a number of of the great players. Wow, Arthur Press. Yeah, and I mean, if you if you think about it, 1949, he died in 1961. So we're pretty close to the end of his life. I mean, that he's making these drums. So exactly to hand yeah. make and crank out 61 known um, drums is is pretty impressive for one guy. Because obviously, we know we're not talking about a factory. Um, cranking these things out um so uh, all right then then how as we get closer to the end of his life what what happened there well uh he he developed uh uh leukemia cancer Mm -hmm. and uh ted reed said he came into to to they were very close ted reed and and billy gladstone were very close billy gladstone came into ted reed's studio in new york and and he said he was as brown as a coffee bean uh and and he he died shortly thereafter and yeah yeah really a kind of a sad story i mean you know he never really he 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 i guess you'd say he was famous but but not really you know i mean yeah Drummer famous, you know. Drummer famous, yeah. Drummers knew about him, but yeah. but the world didn't, unfortunately. Yeah, well, I tried to change that by writing the book. <laughs> and right now, I mean, us talking about it is um, kind of spreading the knowledge. And I mean, I think people can go down the um, rabbit hole of looking at pictures of all these amazing drums. Would you say they are one of the most collectible snare drums or drum set in you know in out there? Well, of course, I'm prejudiced, but sure. but it's the most collectible, uh, and I <laughs> yeah. thought that from the very from the get go. I mean, you know, people when, when I would when I would pick up one of these drums and and I would reveal how much I paid for it, people said you're you're crazy, you're spending that kind of money on a drum. And well, yeah, I guess I am, but but yeah. you know, I, I think someday they're going to be worth a lot of money, and they are. You know, now those drums are going, uh, you know, five figures. Jeez, yeah, it's an investment. That is one thing where. Uh, I think you you probably you know you you saw it early on, but they are definitely. It's not just a uh, it's it's a collector's drum. It's not really like a you know. Do people if if in your experience, if people buy these drums, do they typically play them out, or do they sit more on a shelf and be you know you you drool over it 
or did people really use them? No, people use them. Yeah, I I used them. I, sure. I I played I played the drums. The set I was I was really reluctant because I you know they're taking four pieces out out was uh you know how, how do you, how do you uh, you know I'm not an octopus I can't have <laughs> I don't have four arms yeah, I can't have sure. carry all of them together. But but yeah, I played them out. Um, and, and they're they're just fabulous sounding drums. In fact, uh, there's another YouTube video that uh, my good friend Paul Testa came to visit me. I was living in in Italy at the time came he and his wife D came to visit me and um, he said hey do you mind if I play these and I said that's what they're that's what they're there for you know not, not to sit on the shelf they're there to be played yeah. so one by one he played him and and fortunately thank God he uh, 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 put up his video camera and videoed the thing and yeah. just recently just last month he said hey Chet you know we, we were talking about me me selling the set to, to David he said you know I I have that video would you like it I said would I like it you know of course I would like it <laughs> and I, I ended up putting it up on YouTube so if if people want to hear what a Gladstone sounds like uh, there are uh, you know he, he plays all six of my drums um, and you can hear the difference between it's very subtle but you can hear the difference between each one of the drums and Paul's a fabulous player. So, um, you know, you'll be able to awesome. appreciate it that way too. Yeah. And I'll put per usual, I'll put that stuff in the description, uh, of this for people to watch that video. So before we wrap up, I just got to ask, because like I said, uh, you know, in, in order, the previous episode to this one was a little info about Ted Reed. You obviously knew the guy, um, I don't know, maybe just like I kind of touched on some biography of him, but just can you tell us just a little bit about Ted? You said he was a really nice guy. Um, there's there, like there's not too much biographical information about him. We know he played with uh, some great players and was just a serious working drummer, but it's it's neat to hear from you about s talking to him and spending so much time with him and learning from him. Well, probably the probably the most most interesting thing is when when I first talked to him, I, I of course wanted a Gladstone drum. I mean that that was yeah. my sole intent. I want a drum. Sure. Um, and and so I I said, you know, would you consider selling any of the drums? And he said, absolutely not. <laughs> he said, hopefully you'll find one before I do. Wow. <laughs> he said, but I'll I'll pick up every drum. And so, you know, it was kind of funny at the same time. It's kind of sad because yeah. I knew of, of he had seven of them. Um, uh, I knew that, you know, I'd never see any of them. But then shortly thereafter, <laughs> he uh, sent me a note. I had a whole exchange of, of, of correspondence with him. He sent me a note and said, well, I've decided I'm going to sell you uh, Billy's Gretsch Gladstone drum. And I, Oh my God, this is incredible, right? <laughs> and he said, I'll sell it to you for $250. Wow. <laughs> well, as you can imagine, I couldn't get to the post office fast <laughs> yeah. enough. And so I mailed it off and the drum came and uh, it just, just it, it's gorgeous. I've, I've subsequently sold that drum. That was the other drum that, that uh, Steve Maxwell just brokered for mm. me. Um, but it was a beautiful drum and, and, uh, Shortly thereafter, I, 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 I changed the drum over to uh, gut and I varnished some gut and, you know, I, I followed what, what I thought was, was the correct procedure for doing uh, Billy Gladstone gut snares, right? And, and Ted wrote back and he says, well, I'm glad you got the drum to sound the way you wanted to do. He says, but, but you're wrong. He didn't use varnish. He used shellac, hmm. not varnish. And I thought, well, you know, obviously, I don't know what the hell I'm doing. <laughs> so I put the drum back exactly the way Ted sent it to me, including the heads, the snare wires, everything was exact. And when I sold it just recently, it, it went out the same way it came to me. And mm. uh, Ted was just, uh, just, it was just incredible to me that he knew so much about Billy and admired Billy so much. You know, there was a, a mutual admiration, obviously, between the two of them. Ted was a great teacher as well. Um, and, and so it was, it was nice having that experience dealing with Ted and, and dealing with his, his collection. One of the other yeah. Gladstone drums that he had, uh, ended up in my collection. That was Louis Belson's. And it was because, uh, uh, Louis, 
he offered the drum back to to Louis Belson. That's when my relationship with with Ted Reed uh, kind of took a dip because Ted was so upset because um, he sent the drum back to Louis. And, and Louis immediately sold it to me. Oh, so Ted, Ted, Ted was, <laughs> as you can imagine, kind of missed by that. Yeah, like that's, but, you know, that wasn't, wasn't the intention. <laughs> no, that was not the intention. It was my fault, you know. And, no. I mean, if Louis wants to sell me the drum, great. Gee, wow. you know, and, and, and it's, a, it's an incredible drum. Yeah. Oh, man. Was <laughs> but, Ted, um, last question about Ted. I mean, was he. Please. So syncopation was such a famous is such a famous and just but it's just everyone has a copy of it of course yeah i mean what were did he ever talk about that or you know he must have i mean been able to support himself and and at least because a lot of authors know that you don't make that much money off books um but it, <laughs> i can it, i can tell you <laughs> that's most definitely true yes but if you write one of the most famous drum books that's you know every student's got it, it did he talk about his, you know, the popularity of um, syncopation at all? Well, no. I mean, you know, it's kind of taken for granted. You know, it's 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 the seminal one of the seminal books that's out there, yeah. and so we never really talked about it that much. Sure. But he was also a great teacher. I mean, he had a he a whole, had a whole cadre of students, hmm. um, uh, and so I, I think he made a lot of money that way too. Was, was giving lessons. Yeah. Cool. Well. Um, this has just been really, really cool, Chet. And I want to say that I know I've gotten multiple recommendations over the years uh, from people about doing a Billy Gladstone episode and um, kind of one of those things where so many people suggested it. I'll just say thank you to everyone instead of individually saying it. But obviously a big thank you to David Wood, who um, originally emailed me about what we all heard about before from David, but said, you got to talk to Chet. And he got me your email and got us in touch. And then... <laughs> and then we put this together pretty darn fast, which uh, sometimes these take uh, as long as three years to book, which was a recent one. But we got yours together in about a week, week or two. So, um, yeah. So uh, and Chet is going to be kind enough to hang out and uh, we're going to do a bonus episode, which people can find on Patreon. And we're going to talk about um, another story about him finding uh, one of his ultra rare uh, Billy Gladstone snare drum. So if you want to hear that, you can go to um, drumhistorypodcast.com, click the Patreon button, and um, there's all the bonus episodes there. So Chet, is there anything you want to uh, promote? I will put a link in the description where people can buy the book. Um, it's it's a must have for drummers. But uh, yeah, Chet, anything else you want to where people can find you a website or anything like that? Well, um, uh, I, I mentioned a couple of times there, there's, there's, there's a, a number of videos on YouTube. It's sure. under my name, Chet Falzerano. Uh, there's also a uh, Facebook. Uh, if, you, if you search Billy Gladstone, uh, you'll find a, a, a tribute page that I, I put together for him uh, that, that has a lot, of, a lot of it, good information that people send in to me and and so it's a, it's a, it's a nice place to 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 find out about Billy Gladstone. But between that and and the YouTube and the book, um, yeah, that's sure that's the way to to find out about the man. Yeah, perfect. And I'll link all that uh, down below. And if if okay. you're looking for it on your own, Chet's last name is uh, Falzerano, F A L Z E R A N O, and cool. um, you can uh, check out everything he's doing. So now Chet and I are going to hop over and do the bonus episode. And uh, Chet, thanks uh, for taking the time to do this. It's always a pleasure to have another Ohio boy on the, uh, <laughs> on the <laughs> yeah, podcast. <boy. laughs> it's been my pleasure. Yeah, it's been my pleasure. If you like this podcast, find me on social media at Drum History and please share, rate, and leave a review. And let me know topics that you would like to learn about in the future. Until next time, keep on learning.